Hey everyone, my name is Damien and welcome back to another episode of Broken Sylvia, even though the channel's mainly been about the Skyline. So, I promise we're gonna get back to this car very, very soon. We've been doing a bit of work on it behind the scenes to try to get it running kind of soon, but this car is priority and I don't wanna get the builds kind of mixed and match like you see an episode of the Skyline, then you see an episode of the Sylvia. So, even if this car is running before the Skyline, I'm not posting any videos before this build is done, which, is, which should be the next few months. Anyways, that's not what the purpose of this video is. The purpose of this video is, as I said, it's gonna be more of a raw vlog style, me talking about things I would do differently, uh, things I've stuffed up on, just showing the side that social media doesn't usually show. So even my videos, I do try to promote quality and entertainment and try and motivate a few people to give it a crack themselves because firstly, if you have the time to do it, it's gonna save you a lot of money and you get greater satisfaction doing it yourself. You also learn a few things along the way. So, I've got notes because I tried to film this video last night and it absolutely sucked. We've got a proper microphone set up this time. I know this place is huge and it does echo, but hopefully the microphone will fix the audio issues a little bit. My voice is still a little bit hey going, but um, yeah, we'll get through it. So the layout of the video will be, I'm gonna talk about what I would do differently or I stuffed up and then I'll put the videos over the top to at least try uh, make it a little bit more enjoyable. And also, when I explain things, it's easier when you have a visual re representation as well. All right, so the first thing I would do differently, and that is, you know when the car was in primer and I was blocking it back with the 320, uh, I would still block it by hand with the 320, but instead of wet rubbing it with the 600, I would actually just get a little palm sander with an interface pad, which is just a piece of foam, and a dry piece of sandpaper, such as 600 grit. So. Uh, the reason with the wet sanding is just to remove the 320 marks for them to be smooth enough. Now, I would ditch that um, 600 wet and dry method and I would just go straight to the palm sander because once you're done with the 320 grit, the blocking by hand, the panel's nice and straight. The 600 is not gonna get that panel any straighter. It's already straight, so the purpose of the 600 is to remove the 320 grit sand marks to get them ready for paint, which means totally doable with the whizzer and it would save you a lot of time so that's the first thing I'll do differently second question is to do with the spray booth now why did I spray this car in the spray booth and I sprayed this car under a gazebo well at the time I didn't really want to hire a spray booth uh, while well, this time around I didn't want to paint it even though I've got this huge workshop to paint a car in the main reason I didn't want to spray it here is I didn't really have the time to build a mini spray booth like a gazebo version and also I didn't want to destroy these floors because I know Zed, the landlord, would probably kill me. Um, so yeah, I didn't want to stuff up the floors and for the sake of 500 bucks, that's the next question, how much was the spray booth hire? It was $500 for about four sessions. So the car was in the spray booth uh, at the spray shop for about seven to 10 days. I was in and out, I had a few exams to do and stuff so I couldn't be there every single day. Um, and that goes to my next point. It's very inconvenient. You have to get the car trailered there. Luckily, we actually ended up buying Scott's trailer, uh, Harry, Danny, and I, so that didn't cost us anything. But again, if you have to pay for a tow truck to get your car to a spray booth, that's an added cost. So yeah, the whole spray booth thing, and I'm not very happy with how it turned out out of the spray booth either. It's good. Um, it's very easy to remove the dust. Super, super easy. The whole car needs to get wet, sanded, and polished up anyways. Uh, but to be honest, as I said before, this car turned out cleaner under a gazebo than this one did out of a spray booth, which makes absolutely no sense, but that's just how it turned out. Um, so yeah, the, the upside of the spray booth was good lighting. You could see what you're doing, uh, even though I did miss a few sections, but we're gonna get to that as well. Moral of the story with the spray booth, what I would do differently, I wouldn't go to a spray booth again, I would get a gazebo with some uh, plastic sheets on the floor, and just wing it. So, saves you money, you can do it at your own workshop, uh, if you have the space to do it. Uh, and another thing I'd like to add is, two-pack paint spraying, spraying two-pack paint in Australia is, I think, illegal, unless you're in a spray booth. So the next question is, why did you paint the car with the panels on? I've gone through that in the previous episode, I'll give you a two-second version of it. Pretty much, uh, when I was walking across the whole car and painting it, that ensures that every single panel will, uh, from front to back, will have the same shade of Bayside Blue, uh, and there's no differences in color. So that was the main reason. But 
what I've realized is when I, the, the week after when I went to spray the bumpers and the side skirts, that they were painted off the car, totally different weather, totally different week, um, not the same day, and they turned out the exact same color as the car, so that just goes to show that you don't need those panels on the car to get a nice even finish. Now that leads to my, my next point uh, of why I would do it differently. So if the doors were off the car, what would that allow me to do? That would allow me to spray the inside of the doors and the outside of the doors at once, the same day. And that would also allow me to spray the outside of the car and the inside of the door jams at once. What does that mean? That means that you save yourself a lot of time in masking and you get an overall nicer finish. So that's another thing I would like to change. Um, you would definitely, instead of spending four days in the spray booth, you would probably spend two days in the spray booth. So there you go, that's another thing. Um, what gun did you use and what were the settings? The gun was a Devilbus. I'm not too sure about the settings, and this is another thing I would like to change. So if I were to do it again, I would get a little air rig on the bottom. I'm pretty sure the higher the pressure, the, that means the less orange peel or the less, less textury finish you're going to end up with. And as I'm about to show you guys, this car is very, very textury, um, but that's fixable. How you fix that is you wet sand the clear coat and you buff it up, um, which is an easy fix. It would have to be done anyways, so it's not that big of a deal. But going back to what I'm saying is if I had a little air rig on the bottom of the gun and I could control the amount of pressure and maybe even go faster with my arm speed, I think I could have got a, a lot nicer finish off the gun such as the Sylvia. So there you go, that's another thing. Also, the, the gun, what I did like about it is it did spray quite nice and the cup system, I think it's like a 3M uh, disposable uh, cartridge cup system. I'll put some photos in, I absolutely love that. You don't use a traditional pot where you have to clean it out after every use, you just throw it in the bin, clean the gun out, and put another one on. So going from white, blue to clear takes takes 20 seconds. You just flush the gun out with a bit of thinners, put your new pot on, and you're good to go. So what brand of paint and how much paint did you use? So the brand of paint I used is Protec. It's made by PPG. I'm pretty sure it would be Australia only, so if you're in the US, I don't think you'd be able to get your hands on it, but again, you can just use PPG. There's many, many other good brands out there, uh, but do make sure that you stick to two-pack. Don't use acrylics, don't use your en enamels. You're just wasting your time. The two-packs are way more durable. You get a nicer finish. Uh, so yeah, definitely use the two-pack. And how much paint was used? So we won't worry about the white ground coat, even though about six liters was used. But in terms of the Bayside Blue, seven liters of paint was used. So that's seven liters before you mix it. Um, so obviously it's a one-to-one -one ratio, which means seven liters of blue goes with seven liters of thinners, so you get 14 liters in total, which is quite a bit of paint, but do remember that this is a full color change. The engine bay, the outside of the car, the inside of the door jam, the inside of the boot, all of that got painted. So we did go through quite a bit of paint. And now going back to what I would do differently again is, for example, if you, I used a white ground coat, and again, I'll go back to the reason why I did that. I used the white ground coat because when you put the blue over the top, you get this nice, light, uh, Bayside blue color. If I used a darker ground coat and put the blue over the top, the Bayside blue would be a little bit darker. Now, what's the advantage of going for a darker ground coat? It, uh, the advantage of that is, is when you go to cover it with the Bayside Blue, it takes a lot less coats to cover over a darker color as opposed to the white color, which means you'd save yourself uh, maybe one, one and a half liters of paint. And if you're in a bit of a budget, that could you know, be one or two hundred dollars, even though I definitely wouldn't be cheaping out on paint because once the car is painted and if you've done a good job, this finish will last you many, many years to come. Man, we're getting through this. Information and knowledge. Where do you learn to work? How did you learn to work on cars? And again, we'll just stick specifically to this. So it all started with dad, got into cars, then you find out about channels such as Mighty Car Mods and you're like, uh, normal guys working on their cars makes you believe that you can do it. So that's kind of where it started. Now, the, I find a lot of motivation uh, from other YouTubers, Beers for Build, a dude that started with working on a BRZ, had no clue what he's doing, and now he's just built a twin turbo LS uh, Lamborghini. So that just goes to show that if you don't have a clue what you're doing, if you start chipping away at it and doing it, you can learn a lot along the way. So yeah, 
Again, sticking specifically to the paint side of things, we are, uh, I think the best YouTube channel would be The Gunman. And the guy's actually from Perth. Now, the, what I would do differently is I would go back and watch The Gunman videos before spraying this car because this was my first time ever spraying a metallic and I'm sure I could have picked up a few tips because a few of the panels didn't turn out as nice as they could have uh, just because of one silly mistake that I'm going to get to. So yeah, definitely if you're looking at a lot of paint information, the gunman, the guy is a professional, professional in the trade, he does that for work, he's a very honest dude, so just go, go check out a few of his videos um, and you'll get a hang of it. Alright, so now it's time to look at all my mistakes. Now. We'll, go, we'll start with the side skirt. The side skirt was so, so stupid of me. The bottom of the side skirt, fully covered in Bayside Blue, looks amazing. While the top of the side skirt looks cool until you find a small little strip that I totally missed to paint. I totally missed a strip um, that you can still see a little bit of the primer through and maybe a little bit of the white. And that is just, I didn't position the side skirt properly on the rack and I totally missed the spot. It was hot, I was rushing. And that just goes back to the whole spray booth thing. I was under the pump to try to get this car out and all my parts out of there as soon as possible. So again, if I did it under my own conditions uh, in an environment I feel comfortable in, I, a mistake like that definitely wouldn't have happened. The second mistake is the mirror. Now, the mirror actually got dropped the first time I painted it. It hit the floor, so I had to re-sand it. And then I put a bit of blue over the top. Looks amazing. And then I go to clear coat it and guess what I do? I totally miss a patch where I need to clear coat it, so there's a dry spot on the inside of the mirror that needs to be redone. So that's two mistakes so far. Then we have the next mistake, which is the front bumper. No big deal. Uh, some of these, some of these parts in there have a, a few little dry spots. You can't really help it. It's really hard to get a, a gun in there. No one's ever going to see it. But I'm just again pointing out uh, what I made a mistake on. And also, when I loaded the parts up, there's a just a little piece there um, that I damaged. So that just goes to show, yeah, yes, you are excited to bolt this car back together, but it's very important when you're transporting these parts that you really do make sure that you mask them up properly, uh, which I didn't. And so now the biggest mistake of the car, which is this poor little bonnet. It's, a, it's an original R34 GDR V-Spec 2 bonnet. So it's a full carbon fiber bonnet, but I made it look the worst on the car. Not the end of the world, under these lights it looks horrible, outside you don't even notice it, but let me explain. This bonnet made the car look like a zebra, and how I did that is I put the white ground coat down, and then I put two or three layers of the blue over the top. Now, about the third layer, I don't know why I did this, I should have gone back and watched some Gunman videos, is I started caking on the blue colour. And what does that lead to? That leads to stripiness. What you're actually supposed to do is you're supposed to go a little bit heavier, I believe, on the first two coats, and then the, the, you know, the third and the fourth coat, you should really let off and just dust on the color, which is the total opposite. I went third and fourth coat super, super heavy and left stripes behind. Uh, once I clear coated it, I just I didn't see it in the spray booth. The lights there just aren't good enough to pick it up, even though the first time I realized it is on my Instagram video. For some reason, my eyes, but my phone could pick it up, and I couldn't sleep that night. I was just looking back and forth to the video, and when I went back to the spray shop the next day to pick the car up, yep, it was true that the bonnet did look like a zebra, and that includes the roof and the boot. The roof and the boot aren't, aren't too horrible, it's just mainly the bonnet. So, I might redo it, I might not. We've got something big planned in March that we want this car and another car done for. Um, so, yeah. I'm probably not going to redo it now, but in the near future, I'm sure I'm going to respray it again. So the next issue is this carbon fiber. I believe it's called a knacker duct or something like that. Um, it's obviously a part of the bonnet because it's a full carbon bonnet. So the way you do it is you mask up the carbon fiber, you paint the whole bonnet blue, you take the masking off and you clear coat it all at once to seal it in nicely. Now what is the problem here and what I would do differently is my masking job was absolutely horrible. So I masked up the carbon, but I might have gone a bit too far, which means uh, you can see an edge where the, where the old primer was. So you've got blue, you've got like a little edge of primer, and then you've got the carbon. So yeah, it's a bit of a, bit of a bummer, but what do you do?
So I think we are actually at the end of another video. I hope it wasn't too long. I hope the audio is good. And I hope you guys are kind of getting used to me talking to a camera. Let me know how it went. But the main reason I posted this video is to show you guys that mistakes happen. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna learn a few mistakes and you're gonna do a better job next time. Going back from this car, from something I had no clue what I'm getting myself into, that blew out to be a huge project car, and then going into this car, blowing out to be another huge project car, cutting the back end off it, putting the new quarter panels on, putting the car into the rotisserie, things I have never done before. So I'm not a wizard, I'm not talented. Um, it's just talk to people, watch a bunch of YouTube videos, collect that information, and then make up your decision on how you want to do things. I think jobs like these are totally doable with a few friends and maybe a little bit of assistance from professionals. Um, but yeah. And one more thing I'd like to add is what's going to happen in the next episode. So the next episode, we're going to yank the front end of the car and we're going to, we're going to paint the underside of the car. So there's one more layer that needs to be brushed on for the undercoating to be complete which means we can put the fuel tank back in the car and all the freshly uh, powder coated suspension parts, put the new bushings in and then the car should be a rolling shell again on wheels. It won't have brakes and stuff like that. But guess what? We don't worry about that because we have an engine to test fit in the car, do a bit of fabrication work. Um, the engine's cooked, but um, we're gonna rebuild it. Um, but yeah, we're gonna put the engine in, do fab work, change up the content because I know you guys are sick of um, paint work as much as I am. Too much talking, man. I'll see you guys in the next one. Let me know how it went.